السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دا کورس از برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور وی آر ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر الیون ان دا پریویس لیکچر نمبر ٹین آئی ٹاک اباؤٹ دی فرسٹ ایلیمنٹ آف دا برانڈ پکچر اینڈ آئی ڈڈ ایکسپلین دیٹ دی کلیئرٹی آف برانڈ ویژن لیس دا فاؤنڈیشن فار ڈیولپنگ دا برانڈ پکچر اینڈ برانڈ پکچر is a snapshot which leads us to developing the right strategies for the brand in order to leverage it in relation to all strengths the brand has. If we do not have that picture right, the possibility is we may not have the right strategies and over the years we may damage the brand. And I also did talk about the fact that brand picture is externally driven meaning which must reflect the image that consumers have of your brand and it must reflect the promise that the brand carries and which the brand must deliver. And then I talked about different levels of associations with which consumers have in their minds and the levels of associations develop into their minds as one component of the brand image and brand image being an important element of the brand picture that's what we talked about yesterday we are still in that process and uh, to be very clear on how different levels of associations develop into the minds we have to know the attributes and benefits that brands present and the values they address. I think we already have learned that the first level is the minimal level, the second level of associations is the middle level, and the top level is the one which we call brand pinnacle. And every brand must try to occupy that position. Now, the question is, after being very clear about how these levels work, the minimal level is all about attributes, The second level is about the functional benefits which consumers receive. And the top level is about brands addressing your values. The question is, how do you determine these uh, attributes, these features, and these benefits, and how brands present, or rather br brands address those values? The determination of all these comes to you as a result of market research. I mean, that's the only way. There are managers and companies that under certain situations may not go for the marketing research and may like to base the decisions on informal data that they have, the past history, the trends, and on the basis of all that information and data bank, they may make decisions, and the decisions may turn out to be right. But that doesn't mean that you don't go for marketing research. The only way to arrive at very logical findings in relation to the attributes and benefits that brands present and the values they address, we have to go through a qualitative research which is based on needs, like I talked about earlier. And I will touch that topic once again. The reason you carry out that research, because you must try to determine the kinds of responses your brand or your brands evoke in relation to competition. So in other words, you are supposed to be looking into not only the responses relating to your brand, you're also supposed to be looking into the responses which are evoked in the marketplace relating competitors or relating competitive brands. Because unless we can stack up our brand against competition, we, we just cannot maintain and we just cannot ascertain the level of associations of a brand is bound to develop. So in other words, in the absence of a comparison, with um, 
the competitive brands, there's no way that we can establish a sustainable competitive strategy. We have to have a competitive strategy and then we have to sustain that. Unless we do that, we cannot really claim the benefits that the brand offers. Competitive strategies take into account so many different variables, communication being one. If we do not have a very good communication strategy which talks about the point of difference and um, the benefits arising out of that differentiation, we may do harm to our brand because some competitor may start talking about the same benefit by having a very effective communication campaign, making you distressed and perturbed because that's all you can do at that moment. So you have to be proactive and before you can be proactive, you have to have all the facts and figures relating your brand and competitive brands. Having said that, let us now talk about how we go ahead with the research process. Like I pointed out earlier, this research has to be need-based. It can be based on demographics alone. It may also be based on psychographics alone. But when you base the research on needs, provided you have identified the needs correctly, then there's a very high probability that you're going to encompass different important variables within the areas of demographics and, and psychographics. So therefore, need-based segmentation and need-based research becomes kind of all-encompassing. We must identify the right need so that we can have relevant and cogent strategies that really can sustain our business. So need-based is the most important and purpose-serving kind of research, which uh, is the driving force for all our strategies. And remember, all the strategies that we have, meaning a complete set, you will recall um, having learned about um, packaging strategy, pricing strategy, communication strategy, financial strategy, and so many associated strategies that the brand and then the overall business is going to have. Another thing that we have to keep in mind, must not, we must not lose sight of the fact that all these strategies have to be very well aligned, meaning one must lead to another. If we are talking about being very price effective and quality conscious, the reflection of these two claims must be seen in all the strategies that are at work. That's what I mean by alignment. So the alignment has to go across the strategic framework. In order for us to be clear about the alignment across the framework, meaning strategic framework, I would like to develop a strategic brand management model. The ones I'm done with explaining all the concepts that I'm talking about. And uh, that is going to be toward the end of the semester. And I can assure you that we all can learn a lot from that model. I'm talking about so many different concepts. I don't really want you to be burdened by the weight of these concepts. And in order to be clear as to how to be very succinct and very explicit and very brief while you're developing a plan so that there are no extra words within the planning framework, so that every word that you use means either strategically or in execution terms, technically, we're going to talk about all that. So wait until that time. 
we are clear that uh, our research is going to be need-based. And we're also clear that it is the need-based segmentation that we are working on. Now, the question is, what is the population we're going to talk with? It goes without saying that it is the target audience. Who are the consumers who constitute their target audience? It is your customers, your present customers, your past customers, and your potential customers. When I talk about past customers, it automatically means that you're talking about those who are not very loyal, or maybe who are disgruntled, they're dissatisfied due to one reason or another. So you, we have to find out through the research process, what is it that has made them dissatisfied and disgruntled? What are the factors? So the questions that you have to design and ask should be put forward in a way that you should get the intended answer. I don't mean that you should get the answer which you like. No. You have to have the right hypothesis while you're designing one particular question. Maybe you know, or rather you know, that there are some lapses in the distribution system. There are some lapses in the quality control. And there are problems in some other areas. Because you keep getting those kind of complaints from the marketplace in the informal way. When salespeople are in the market and you are in the market, you interact all the time with members of the trade, with consumers, and with all the influencers. And therefore, you know the kind of questions that you must ask in order to bring back to the fold of your brand the lost customers. You must also talk with customers of your competitors because you are out to find out the levels of associations that consumers of your competitive brands have in their minds. And that's the only way to compare your brand against competition. You must also include in your research design category influencers like distributors, retailers, and also competitors, staff. Talking with these people, meeting them once in a while, doesn't really hurt. As a matter of fact, that leads you to go for real, credible market research. There are certain markets where talking with competitors or their staff is against the business religion. But that, fortunately, is not the case in our market. People are friendly, they are receptive, and this doesn't mean that they are going to provide you all the facts and figures relating their brands and companies on a platter. It never will happen that way. All I'm saying is, during the process of conversation, you might be able to figure out something relevant which will help you arrive at cogent findings. The question still remains how to determine the level of associations in relation to A, B, Bs. That's what I may call attributes, benefits, and values. Up until now, we are clear who we are going to talk with, meaning the portion of the population or the target audience. Now, the questions that we're going to ask them, let's discuss those in more detail. You may start with naming your brand, asking the respondent, what is it that comes to the respondent's mind? If the respondent can very easily talk about the identity of your brand or the image of the brand, it means the respondent has top of the mind awareness. There also is a possibility that you are selling a juice brand 
And the respondent might say, yeah, because I've heard this name and maybe you're selling milk or maybe you're selling chocolates, leading you to believe or leading you to ascertain through the research that the respondents do not have top of the mind awareness and what is the fix? What is it that you have to do? Lengthy process. Think of all the variables of the marketing mix. What is it that you may have to do? But a very, very weighty question. The next one is, you may ask the respondents to name the strengths and weaknesses of your brand. Now, nobody has that much time to start counting on their fingers, well, this is one, this is two, this is three. The practical way of going about that is that you list down a few strengths which you think your brand should have or you think your brand does have along with weaknesses when you know that a brand that your brand does not have one particular strength chances are it will become your brand's weakness so you can list those down and assist your respondents tell you very honestly and candidly what they think are the strengths and what they think are the weaknesses. And I think it goes without saying, having known that, you are well set on the way to determining what really is right and what really is wrong. The next question that you might ask them in relation to the question which I've just talked about is, what is it that has contributed to your perception of our brand, again, in relation to strengths and weaknesses? Now, this may sound like a very open-ended question the answer to which can maybe in paragraphs, uh, but that's not the inten intention. The intention again is to be very brief and list down a few factors that may contribute uh, toward building up certain perceptions on part of the uh, respondents. Uh, those factors could be relating uh, distribution, or factors could be relating the product quality in the first place. Um, it could be about very effective communication, like uh, your brand is very good, it's uh, of good quality, and at the same time, the communication is so good, the campaign that you have launched on the television and also in the paper, etc., etc., makes such a good contact with us, and it touches such an emotional chord inside here that you know, we remember what's going on in the market. So you are in a position to find out what really contributes toward their perceptions if you have designed your question very realistically and practically. A few more questions. You can ask respondents, what are their expectations of your brand? Again, a question, the answer to which can be very open-ended. But the trick here again is to list down a few expectations and while you list those down, those again have got to be very well aligned with all the things and with all the variables, with all the aspects that you already have listed down in order to elicit and evoke answers from the respondents. And don't forget, these are the factors which are part of the strategies that you are going to develop. And you're very clear about the strategic direction because you have the right vision. You already have built that. And you are now in the process of building up the brand picture. You can frame the next question like, what really are your expectations? And again, you have to list down a few things that you think and it should be uh, forming their expectations. You can ask them the benefits that your the brand provides them with. Here, again, you've got to be very clever and very realistic. When I say clever, it doesn't really mean that you have to outsmart your uh, uh, respondent or your customer or, you know, competitor's customer. No. The objective is to find out what really are the benefits which uh, the respondent is receiving. And uh, only if you know that very correctly, that you can find out the right level of associations that the respondent has developed with your brand. You can ask another question to your respondents like, um, would you recommend our brand to others? If you would, why? 
This again is a very qualitative kind of a question. And the respondents will need some kind of assistance from your side in order to be able to answer this question. Do the same I explained earlier. Maybe you have a multiple choice kind of answers and read those out to the respondent for them to give you one or a combination from within those multiple listings. This question is asked because there are many consumers in the marketplace, you being one as a consumer, who always like to talk about brands. You may not have seen a person who never talks about re recommending one brand to uh, their friends, or their relatives, uh, their neighbors, so on and so forth. Why does that happen? You have to be clear about that before you design this kind of a question. You remember that the brands satisfy your decision process, that your decision was the right decision to go for the brand because it was a wise decision. You like to make sure that it was the optimal decision because you went for the best brand. And when you go for the best brand to purchase, that is a reflection of your personality. You are important. You are different. And you have you know, a set of values which really fulfills your self-esteem and which makes you important. And you like to convey that to others. And when others follow, you feel even more important. That's the way the psychological process works. So you have to ask this question. If the respondents are going to recommend your brand to others, why? And when you ask why, again, you may as well have a small listing of different variables from within which they have to choose one or maybe more than one. You may ask them a question like, how would you describe our brand to others? This question also will fall within the domain of a brand persona, which I'm going to talk about in a short while. This question will lead to respondents to tell you, or rather, will lead them to describe your brand. If you're selling a motorbike, and you think that you are making something which is very sturdy and rugged, and the respondents say they describe your brand as sturdy, rugged, strong, you feel confident that the positioning of your brand is right, the attributes, features that you added on to the brand are just about perfect, and the benefits, the features and attributes are translating into are just about the right ones. And therefore, the level of association which I want developed in the mind of the consumer is there. Excellent. Another question that you might ask uh, your respondent says, uh, does our brand make them feel differently? And this is very much related to uh, one of the questions I talked earlier, that people do have um, a self-image. And uh, when they buy brands, they want to reassure themselves of the self-image. And they also like to portray that image to others. So if they really feel differently by using your brand, meaning important, that gives you a very good lead into determining the level of association which your brand has developed in the marketplace. This was a set of possible questions that you may incorporate into your research design while going ahead with determining the ABVs, meaning attributes, benefits, and values. Now, if you are working for a company which is very small or which is small and does not have the kind of budget to go for this kind of research, because market research is carried out by the marketing research professionals. 
this is not something which is uh, generally taken care of uh, by the marketing staff themselves. But if you're a small company that may not be in a position to afford that, then you might as well like to have answers to all these questions that I talked about yourself. Maybe in a formal way, by designing a questionnaire, or maybe in an informal way. The objective is to have, in any case, answers to the questions. Because without those answers, there's no way that we can determine uh, the levels that we must know consumers have with the brands in relation to associations. So we can summarize that the purpose this kind of research serves is primarily aimed at finding out the level of associations customers ascribe to your brand versus competition. I was talking about the questions and the kind of answers which you should try to elicit from the respondents, which you should try to, uh, well, when I say try to elicit, what I mean is that you have to be very realistic uh, in uh, uh, getting those uh, responses. It is not that uh, you have to evoke responses the way you want, like I told you earlier. Um, the responses have got to be about your brand and the responses have got to be about competition's brand so that you can draw out comparisons. We learned while discussing collection of additional data from within the industry that definition of the industry you are a part of has to be broad enough to include all competitors and to include all, vari all variables that impact your brand, but then at the same time, it has to be narrow enough to enable you to draw realistic and practical comparisons. So the market research that we are talking about leads you toward drawing those kinds of comparisons. And while you do that, you incorporate in your design maybe a couple of competitors, not all the players who form the industry, because then it becomes very cumbersome. If you relate yourself with uh, the two or three of the major players, plus one of the newcomers, I think the design of the research should be well serving. Through the analysis of the research that you have carried out, you determine whether or not customers believe that your brand has reached the highest level of associations, meaning the pinnacle, as the kind of answer you must find out through that research. No matter how qualitative the research design is, the findings have got to be quantified. If the answer is yes, then it means your brand is very well positioned. And the objective there is to maintain that position, not to lose it, not to let your competitors dislodge that position. If the answer is no, you've got to ask yourself a few more questions. It's a lot of questions that you have to ask yourself and then seek answers in order to arrive at the right findings. It is an ongoing process, meaning you have to keep on asking yourself these questions, sometimes in a very, very formal way and sometimes in a very informal way. In other words, even when you're not in the process of carrying out marketing research, you still have to have answers to all the questions at all times. Because market is a dynamic place. It keeps changing. And in order to keep pace with the changes, you've got to stay very alert. And you've got to be right on top of things. Coming to the questions that you must ask yourself if your brand is not on top, are, number one, why is it on, not on top? Naturally, the answer which you must try to find out is what is to be done. You have to bring into a very sharp focus the problem area, meaning you have to identify the problem, whether there's something wrong with uh, the production process because of which 
something has gone wrong with the quality, or maybe there is something wrong with uh, the packaging, meaning the way the product appears, or the brand appears. One of the objectives of uh, developing a nice package is that consumers must get satisfaction out of the attractiveness of the package. Maybe there is something wrong with uh, the dis distribution system and your brand is not available all over. So you have to identify the problem area so that you can fix that. The next question that you must ask yourself, if competition is right on top, what is the reason? The answer to this question has got to be very pragmatic, very practical. You do not have to deceive yourself. You do not have to feel bad about competition being on top. You must strive very hard to dislodge that, although it is difficult to do that. It sets, it sets into motion a whole new process, maybe a very effective communication campaign that can negate what competition has gained, or maybe improvement of quality, meaning adding or rather laddering up a few more benefits. And if you do that, You've got to create awareness about that. And again, you know, the process of communication starts. If you cannot do that, meaning if you cannot afford to do that, but you have some problems, to fix those problems, you, you, know, you have to answer some more questions. So the process goes on. You have to, one way or the other, find out why is competition on top. And then the third question stems from the two questions that I've talked about. And it is very obvious. What is it that we have to do? And we have talked about that. You have to take into account different areas where things have gone wrong and fix those. There are three fundamental keys to developing the right associations. I mean, after you've asked yourself so many questions, you have answered questions, Three fundamental keys that I would like to talk about are very important and that adds to our understanding of uh, the concept of uh, the brand value pyramid, meaning uh, the whole concept of development of associations in consumers' mind because that is all we are talking about. The first is that movement from the bottom block to the top, meaning the pinnacle of the pyramid, has got to be incremental. What does that mean? That means that when you are at the lowest level, you just cannot jump to the topmost level. So you have to be at the first level, which is the primary or the elementary level, in order to start the journey. And then you move on to the next level, which provides a higher level of association. And from there, you move on to the top level. So movement to the next level is dependent on achievement of the previous level. We can put that in these words. And then the second fundamental is that there has to be complete alignment among associations. Meaning, whatever your attributes and features are all about, they must be translated the same way into benefits and they must lead to the kind of values which are very much related to the benefits which consumers are enjoying. It just cannot be that you have one set of attributes and benefits and the values which they are generating are very different from the ones they should generate. There has to be complete alignment all across the levels. And the third key is, which is a very important fundamental, make that alignment difficult for competition to follow. And going back to the previous discussion, when you are at the top, it becomes difficult for a competition to imitate you, to follow you, because you have developed some very strong associations in the minds of the consumers. To make the concept of um, alignment among all the levels of associations clear in your minds, let me give you an example. Let us talk about uh, the most popular 
car in 1300cc category in our market. What are the features and attributes? Let's talk about those. You might say it has good styling, the price is reasonable, it is spacious, it gives the looks of a bigger car, it is strong and sturdy. These are a few features which you might think of while taking a look at that brand of car. I leave it to your guess what that model could be. Having identified the features and attributes, let us take a look at the benefits which uh, these features and attributes translate into. Gives me good consumption. It has good resale value. The spare parts are available at uh, customer friendly pricing. The car is dependable. So these are the kind of benefits which a customer enjoy. What are the beliefs and values which this model might touch at the highest level? It gives you confidence. Why does it give you confidence? Your decision to buy that model was right. It is very friendly. It makes you feel good and important. People notice that. And you get, for example, the approval of neighbors, the approval of friends and relatives. Everybody talking about, or rather everybody endorsing your decision. You've got a good car and this could have been the best decision that you have made. So this is one example of uh, the maintaining alignment across the various levels of associations that brands evoke in the hope that whatever we have talked about the levels of associations is clear in our minds. Let us now talk about what happens after the brand has been at the pinnacle for a long time. I did touch upon this in the previous lecture. Either you maintain it because you do not see yourself as a company getting into something else, meaning creating another brand or creating an, another identity. And therefore, you may like to sustain that for a long time to come, you might see a lot of potential for the brand to stay there. There have been quite a few examples in our market of products in various categories. Competitors could have been guessing about a change. They've been guessing about company XYZ coming up with another brand with another name because they've been very successful with one particular brand and thinking that the brand has been at the pinnacle for such a long time, it is high time that they introduced something else. But company XYZ did not do that. Why? Because they understood the market, they understood their customers, and they knew that the potential to maintain the brand at that point and to sustain it was there and they were proved right. The next situation could be, the company might think that brand is being threatened from all directions. What is it that we should do? Well, they might create another brand. To what extent they succeed in that is a separate issue. 
I gave you an example in the previous lecture. If the company has very strong reputation, the company can succeed with a new entry or with a new identity, a new identity altogether with a new brand name. If the company does not have good reputation or if the company makes certain uh, the mistakes with the basic marketing philosophy, the brand may not succeed. But again, this is a separate discussion. What you have to keep in mind, what is it that you should do either to maintain the brand or to introduce another brand? And you've got to be very clear about the timing, you've got to be very clear about the potential, and you've got to be very clear about the threats, and you've got to be very clear about the opportunities that those threats may offer. Having uh, talked about all this, let us now draw the conclusion of uh, the levels of associations. The conclusion is that any brand in any category must try to achieve the topmost slot of the pyramid. It must start from the bottom and that's the only way it can start. There's no other way. And all the way through the top. Once it is there, it has the power to charge price premiums because all the marketing effort that is being undertaken is not being undertaken for the sake of fun. It is being undertaken for the sake of doing some real hard business. So the brand has the power to charge premiums. Customers will accept that. Competitors will find it very hard to follow. And that is where the research findings by PIMS come into play. That is why there is such a lot of difference between the financial contributions offered by two different brands, meaning the number one brand and the number two. There is such a gulf because the topmost brand has the power and therefore the privilege to go for a price premium and therefore good profitability and good price earnings. As a brand manager, you must strive to develop as strong associations as you can. And the way to do that, you know that now. You've learned it. That brings us to the next component of uh, brand image, meaning how to develop that. I keep on rubbing in one point that we did talk about image at one time which was maybe lecture number one or lecture number two. But we only talked about that from the standpoint of a translation of your brand's identity and the need for it to be taken right and the need for the identity to be right. We did talk about those things in a very macro form and now we are right now in the process of building that brand image. And to repeat, Brand image has two components. The one is associations, which deals with brand's characteristics, its properties, its strengths and weaknesses. And the other component is brand persona. Let us now talk about brand persona, because what that is. Along with associations, brand persona provides a complete understanding of the brand image. You have this component, which is associations, and you have another component which is sitting right here and these two coming together form the brand image. Brand managers look at brands from uh, the standpoint of human and other characteristics that can be easily identified. The objective here is to personify the, your brand and let the consumers associate themselves with the brand and let the consumers express themselves about the brand in terms just as they would express themselves and associate themselves with humans. For example, you might talk about somebody being strong and rugged and you may also talk about a product being strong and rugged. 
Let me explain this with the help of a few examples. Let us talk about um, a car. Like I said, you might say the car is very strong and sturdy. Just like uh, people relate to other persons from a certain geographic area and call them strong and sturdy. And that is the case with all the countries of the world. There are certain parts. People from where are known for their certain characteristics. The rugged, the strong, the warriors, the polite, the cultured, the difficult, whatever. So by the same token, you try to personify your brand by giving it characteristics which are very human in nature. And therefore, you can talk about a car which is strong and rugged. An example could be the distinction between a four-wheel drive and a nice-looking luxury sedan. A four-wheel drive vehicle can be described as warrior and tough, for example. Whereas a luxury car can be characterized or personified as something very majestic and stylish and smart. Let us now talk about the brand of biscuits, which is a top of the line brand, and it is basically positioned for afternoon tea time, mostly to serve your honored guests, meaning it is an expensive brand. You may talk about that brand as being sophisticated, just like you talk about a person being sophisticated. You will not call that brand funny. You will not call that brand difficult, for example. By the same token, you might take the example of a brand of biscuits, which is positioned for fun-loving kids, and you might describe that as funny. You may not describe that as serious, as studious, hardworking. No. The objective is to describe your brands and to personify those in human terms so that it becomes easy for you as a brand manager to develop the right identity which can lead to developing right associations. A brand which is meant for improving your skin, for example, in the female segment, has got to look that way. And you've got to describe that in those terms. Delicate, sophisticated, soft, and by giving these personifications, or by characterizing your brand that way, you can develop the right identity. These are a few of the examples. And when we start developing our model, like I said at the beginning of this lecture, which will be toward the end of the semester, we shall develop a very clear understanding of what I'm talking about. But in the hope that we do understand what brand persona is and why it is developed that way, the way should be very clear that brand persona, while working along with the levels of associations with brand characteristics have developed in the minds of consumers, we can develop the right brand, and before that, we can develop the right picture, which is a prerequisite to developing your brand. Now, having said that, we are done with uh, the first element of uh, the brand picture, which is brand image. Just to make sure that there is no confusion, the brand picture, which I started talking about after being done with the brand vision, is that we are discussing now. We are still in the process brand picture has a few elements. The first element is the brand image. 
the brand image has two components which we have completed. One is brand associations, the other is brand persona. Brand associations and brand persona put together gave us the right image. And that is the lesson we have learned in this lecture. Thank you very much for your patience. I look forward to talking with you in the next lecture. Allah Hafiz.